everyone. Our reading today is from Genesis chapter 2 and Mark chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiatar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Katie Evans. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity, and it is wonderful to be with you all this Advent season, this Christmas season. So Mason and I, my, Mason is my husband, uh, Mason and I both have grandfathers who served in the Navy during World War II. And so anytime I hear stories or studies about those servicemen from that time, my interest is automatically piqued. My radar goes up, and so I heard a story this week, uh, and I haven't been able to get it out of my mind because I think it speaks to this sermon series that we're in, this decluttering Christmas. And so as I understand it, I was not there, but as I understand it, when World War II ended, there was joy, and there was celebration, and parades, and balloons, and the men who returned were celebrated. And then if you look, though, at the Vietnam War, a little bit later in history, things were very different. There were no parties, there were no balloons, there were no parades. And the toll on both groups of veterans was really different. If you look at studies, you can see that by and large, the World War II vets who came back, they did really well. They started their lives, they had families. Mason and I are both recipients of that legacy. They thrived in many ways. But when Vietnam ended, we see that those veterans had a different experience of returning home, that for them, drug addiction skyrocketed. We saw suicide rates increase. Spousal abuse was common. PTSD rates were high. And the toll on both groups of veterans um, was different, and it's different because there were really different wars and really different times in history, yes, but also There's one theory that's really interesting to me as I was reading about this, and it's that when World War II ended, most of the troops got on boats, and they came home, and it took them weeks, or maybe even a month, some of them, to get home. And in Vietnam, most of them got on planes, and within a matter of a couple days, they were back in their living rooms with their families. And so why does that matter? It's because when you're on a boat crossing the Atlantic, you have time. You have space and margin, and you can cry. You can tell stories. You can process what has happened to you with people who it has happened to also. But the Vietnam vets didn't have that opportunity. They didn't have time or space to process what had happened, what they had seen, what they had experienced. They had no margin, no space between war and home. And I think that this is a strong metaphor for many of us today. And is it possible that one of the reasons why it's so hard for us to live spiritually and emotionally healthy lives is because we simply don't have the margin and the space and the time in our lives to do it? And so we are in the third week of our series, Decluttering Christmas. 
And yes, the holidays can be stressful and hurried and uh, quicker than usual, but I'll say it's probably just a microcosm of our everyday lives, of our real lives. Christmas time is our normal lives times 10, just moved a little faster. But what we're exploring in this series is what the Bible, what Jesus points us to, that there's perhaps a better way to live, a way that we were designed to live, a way to live in better alignment with how God designed us. And so if you've been following along in your Advent guide today, we are talking about this practice of Sabbath. And Sabbath is a Hebrew word for Shabbat, and it's most uh, usually translated as stop or to cease, to rest. And stop doesn't really fit that well in our culture. We don't talk a lot about stopping things. We talk a lot about starting things and doing things. We live in this non-stop culture, this 24 hours a day, unlimited, I've got to experience everything all the time culture. And stopping is offensive. It's even un-American sometimes. A.J. Swoboda writes this in his book, Subversive Sabbath. The Sabbath has largely been forgotten by the church, which has uncritically mimicked the rhythms of the industrial and success-obsessed West. The result? Our road-weary, exhausted churches have largely failed to integrate Sabbath into their lives as vital elements of Christian discipleship. It's not as though we don't love God. We love God deeply. We just don't know how to sit with God. And he continues, we've become perhaps the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, and spiritually malnourished people in history. And we don't need much convincing that this is true. The center of our region is, after all, the city that never sleeps. And it said with pride, there's always something new to do, always something to do in the city that never sleeps. When I first moved here from Florida, I was looking for a job, and so I met with a recruiter. Uh, So I was in downtown Stanford, and halfway through the interview, the recruiter looked up from my resume and said, oh, I just realized you're from Florida. Do you need me to slow down my speech? (laughs) I said, "Uh, no, I'm understanding you just fine, thank you. (laughs) But his gist was... You're not where you used to be. <laughs> we, we are at a faster pace here. Welcome to Connecticut. <laughs> that was a very great welcome, right? Uh, and so, but living this way, always on, always going, always doing that one last thing or working on six things at once, or think about the tabs on your computer, right? I think I counted 18 open just when I was prepping this sermon. I don't know what I needed 18 tabs for, but there they all were in case I needed them. And so living this way, though, it's relatively new. If you think about it, before the light bulb was invented in 1879, uh, there's a very fun fact for you, 1879, when the sun went down, you were going to sleep also. And so people used to get 11 hours of sleep a night, which sounds pretty glorious. I think we should try it. (laughs) And then in 2007, Steve Jobs introduced us to the iPhone, and our lives have never been the same. After the iPhone, work came home with you. It was in your pocket. And you were expected to always be in touch, to always be on, to always be available. Our lives were more distracted. A recent study found that the average iPhone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day and spends an average of 2.5 hours over 76 sessions on their phones. And it's actually double that for millennials. And I don't want to be alarmist, but that is alarming. <laughs> I don't want to live my life that way, distracted, cut into 76 different chunks of the day. And so the question for me, for us today is, what is this kind of life doing to us? Because it's doing something. It's shaping us into some type of people. But what kind of people is this type of living doing to us? One pastor whose work has been really helpful to me just in general in this season of my life and also for this specific, um, for this specific talk, John Mark Comer wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's very good. I would highly recommend it. But he lays out two different lists in his book. One that highlights the day-to-day reality for many of us in the restlessness 
category. And then the other, the fruit of embracing the way of Jesus. And so I'll give you just a moment. I'm not going to attempt to read these, but look at the lists and see where do you see yourself? Which side of the list do you see yourself in? And where would you like to be in five years, in 10 years, next year? You know, we're all growing, we're all being shaped, and which list would you like to embody? The human condition is that we are finite beings longing for something infinite, which means that we're never quite satisfied, and we drive ourselves to exhaustion. That's why we are a restless people. But my heart for us as a church, as a people, as a community of faith, is that we would live differently, and that we would find ourselves as on the left side of the list, people who are restful. Because that's the type of people who have the time and the margin to spend time with the Lord and to spend time with each other. And those are the type of people who are going to actually be part of bringing the kingdom of God, ushering in the kingdom, because we actually have the time and the margin and the capacity to do it. Because we're not stretched too thin. We're not looking for that next best thing, but that we're part of bringing the kingdom because we are a restful people. God cares more about you than the world does. And when God made you, he created you to live a life of rest and margin, and his plan for you is not burnout. And what if there was a practice a gift from God designed to help us with all of this. And so that's why today we're talking about Sabbath rest in a nonstop world. And we see in our text today that even Jesus, the most peaceful, loving man in history, practiced Sabbath. He wasn't above Sabbath. And so we look back at the passage again in Mark, and we see that one Sabbath day, Jesus and his disciples were walking through the grain fields, as you do, uh, plucking heads of grain. And the Pharisees don't like this because they see that he's working. He's working. And so they confront Jesus, and they say, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And so Jesus responds with a bit of a history lesson for them. He tells them about King David and his companions and probably actually makes the Pharisees even more angry with his response. And then he concludes this encounter with this very, very short but very important line. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. And so you can read this two ways. You can say, see, man, people women, humanity, they aren't made for the Sabbath. And that's actually probably how, if I were to be honest, which I will be, uh, that's how I read it for many years. See, we weren't made for Sabbath. I don't have to rest. I can do this. <laughs> but what he's really saying is that you don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath serves you. And the Sabbath is a gift. It's a resource for you. So to understand this passage, we have to know that Jesus was practicing Sabbath, and it wasn't a knock on Sabbath keeping, as I might have read it once before, but that the Jews would have needed to hear the second half of this statement, not man for the Sabbath, because back then they were bound up in legalism, and they were serving the Sabbath. They were missing the heart of God for the gift that he had given them, and they were bound to the rules, and the Sabbath was heavy, it was a burden, it was death for them, or that's how they saw it. But instead, it's life. And so today we have the opposite problem. Our problem isn't legalism about the Sabbath, it's that we ignore it altogether. I don't know that I've ever had somebody come and in a pastoral moment confess to me, I just keep Sabbath too well. That's just my biggest problem right now. No one has ever said that. I really hope somebody comes and says that today. Uh, so if you're out there, come on. Um, but people like us, we need to hear the first part, that Sabbath was made for man. We need to be reminded that the Sabbath was created and designed for us, and that it's a gift given to us by our creator, and it's meant for us to enjoy, to delight in, and to receive with gratitude, to receive the gift of Sabbath. And if we go back to the very beginning, to the Genesis creation narrative, we see that God built the idea of Sabbath right into the very fabric of the universe. God worked for six days, and then he stopped. He rested, and he blessed the day. 
and he made it holy. It was the first holy day, holiday, you could see, right there in the Genesis narrative. And when we fight this rhythm, when we fight this work six days, rest one day, we go against the grain of how things are supposed to work. And I love the way that the philosopher H.H. H. Farmer puts it. When you go against the grain of the universe, you get splinters. And how many of us are living with splinters in our soul? And we don't know exactly why or how to move out of that. During the French Revolution, the government had this bright idea that they would switch from a seven-day work week to a 10-day week with the hope of getting more work out of their people. So essentially, they would work for nine days and then rest for one, and they wanted to see productivity increase in the country. But unfortunately, for whoever had this fine idea, it backfired. And they actually saw the economy crash, they saw the suicide rates increase, and then productivity actually went down. And there's another study that I read that basically said that after working 55 hours in one week, you just aren't that much more productive. That whether you work 80 hours and whether you work 55, that the output is about the same. And if you do the math, 55 hours is basically a six-day work week. So could it be that God knew what he was doing when he designed the universe and when he gave us the Sabbath. Our bodies and our minds are wired in such a way that it's almost as though God intended us to live this way. And we need Sabbath. We need rest. The Sabbath is how we fill our souls back up. I heard someone say recently that the Sabbath allows our souls to catch up with our bodies because our bodies are moving so quickly from thing to thing to thing. But the Sabbath rest allows us to catch back up, allow our soul to catch back up. And so what do we mean? What does this actually look like? Well, when we look back at the Genesis text, we see that it's really about resting and delighting. So after six days of creating, God stopped. Um, and we see in the text, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and then he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And it's this word, rested, that can be translated as stopped, ceased, but also delighted. So God looked back on all that he had done, and he saw that it was good. He delighted in it. And so he stopped, and he delighted, and he Sabbathed, the first Sabbath. I love how the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann puts it. The divine rest on the Sabbath day of creation has made clear that, A, Yahweh is not a workaholic, B, that Yahweh is not anxious about the full functioning of creation, and that C, the well-being of creation does not depend on endless work. And I keep thinking about that. What would it look like for us to arrange our lives in such a way that each week we have one day where we stop and we rest and we worship and we delight in God? Or what would it look like to start with a half day or with two hours? Because any Sabbath rest is better than no Sabbath rest. And so here's the thing. It's going to look different for all of us. It's going to be a journey for all of us. And what is working for me might not work for you. And this practice is so far out of the norm of what most people in our culture do and what everyone else is doing is that it may feel, as you're sitting here, like a huge leap. And maybe you're not even convinced that this is something that is worth trying, but what I will say is don't write it off as not doable or as something that wouldn't work in your life until you try it. Because from my own experience, once you try it, you're not going to want to stop. So let's just pause for a moment. Talking about Sabbath can be a little emotional. It might stir some things in you. So for some of you, you might be feeling longing you long to begin to practice Sabbath. You wonder why we haven't been talking about this for the last two, five years, 10 years. Where was this concept? And you wish that you would have started. You wish you would have known. For others of you, you might feel curious. Oh, that's interesting. Not good for you, not really for me. And others of you might be feeling resistance, maybe even some anger. 
about this concept. I heard a pastor say once that the time he lost the most people from his church was when he started to talk about the Sabbath. <laughs> Because it's just so weird and countercultural and different than what the world is doing. It's offensive. So don't leave. Don't leave yet. We're not done yet. So the first time I seriously started to consider Sabbath as a practice in my own life, I thought, it sounds incredible. We got to try this. And so I started reading and researching a little bit more. And, um, but then the more that I found out about it and the more that I read, I actually found that the angrier that I got... And so I remember listening to uh, an audio book on the topic when Chloe was about six months old, and I vividly remember standing in our kitchen, packing lunches for daycare and freezing baby food, as you do when you have a young child, and listening to this author go on and on and on about how glorious his Sabbath rest was and how he could hear his children playing in the background, and he drank his second cup of coffee, and he read his Bible, and he Sabbathed, and he took wonderful walks alone with God in nature. And I got so angry standing there <laughs> doing my baby food. <laughs> and I was angry at him, and I was angry on behalf of his wife, <laughs> because I kept thinking in my sleep-deprived state... The only reason you are Sabbathing is because your wife is not, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and when does your wife get to Sabbath? That's what I wanted to know. I was so angry. Oh, yes. <laughs> and all this to say, this is nothing to say about Mason, my husband, and about my own, <laughs> our own relationship. He's not even here. I wish he could have heard that applause, though. <laughs> but here's the thing. I didn't even know these people. They didn't know me. I was just listening to the book. And I was getting so angry. The idea of Sabbath agitated me. Something about it in me made me irritated. And so as I thought about it, I thought about what is the reason why I'm so angry? Well, I'm angry because I'm just so, so tired, bone tired. And you might not have young children, but I believe that some of us today are just exhausted. And then the second reason was that I do have young children. I have a one-year-old now and a four-year-old, and I couldn't imagine ever being able to rest well again. <laughs> and I was jealous. I was jealous of this guy and his second <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> and then in some weird way, I was offended by the author. I thought, who are you to tell me to take a 24-hour break? You don't know anything about my life. And this baby food is not going to make itself. <laughs> But over time, as I listened, and I read some other authors, and I read some more, and Mason and I talked about it, and we spent time with the Lord and brought it to him, my longing for deep soul rest and my curiosity overrode my anger. And so this past fall, Mason and I, and Luke and Chloe, as a family, started to practice Sabbath. Sabbath. And I say practice because that's what it is. We don't get it right all the time. It's a journey, right? Sometimes we call it Sabbath light because we just haven't quite gotten it that weekend. Um, but it's worth trying. And so we practice, we try it, and then we tweak it, and then we learn from it. But some rest is better than none. And so our goal today is really just to spark a curiosity, about Sabbath. Maybe this is a new subject to you. Maybe you've heard other people talk about it, but you never thought this could be for me. We can't cover everything about it. There are people who have devoted their whole lives to doing that, and I can recommend some great books. Um, but this is more of just to create an appetite, a curiosity around the practice. And so, how can you try it? Well, so the first step is just to pick a day. You pick a day and you say, I'm going to try it. Now, you might have to pick a day a month or two out because we live such fast-paced lives that your calendar might already be booked, and that's okay. You can just anticipate your Sabbath is coming. <laughs> but so you pick a day, you clear your calendar, or you protect that day that you have picked. Then you turn your phone off to unplug, or if that's a bridge too far, turn it on Do Not Disturb and put it on the other side of you for a little bit. And then you just practice resting and delighting in whatever way is going to fill your soul back up and allow you to connect with God and with others in whatever way works. And so just to be clear, Sabbath is not the same thing as having a day off. Those are wonderful, and they're good, but this is a more intentional 
day around resting and delighting. And so traditionally, there are some activities that mark a Sabbath practice, um, and you don't necessarily have to do all of them. You don't have to do any of them, but I'll just share them with you. So traditionally, uh, lighting candles, blessing your children, eating a meal together, worshiping with your church, taking walks, napping, reading, spending time alone with God, spending time with family and friends, cultivating gratitude. Those are all traditional Sabbath activities. And so this isn't a to-do list. There's no to-dos on the Sabbath. There's no oughts or shoulds. It's just a list of activities that people through the ages have found restorative. And then another helpful way to think about Sabbath is through thinking different kinds of categories, different uh, types of rest. So Tim Keller suggests four different kinds of rest that I liked. He's talked about taking time for some sheer inactivity, so this is literally just time to veg. So maybe it's sleeping in. Mason and I actually switch off each weekend who gets to sleep on the Sabbath. Uh, maybe it's just sitting looking out the window, sitting by a fire, uh, unstructured time for whatever it is that you feel like you and your family need for that day. Uh, then Keller talks about a vocational Sabbath, so something that is fun and different, a change of pace, a palate cleanser from your normal life. It might be something that you enjoy doing, but it might take skill or expertise, so maybe you bake, or you garden, or you play a sport or an instrument, anything from carpentry to music and everything in between. Luke and I have been baking. We've been baking rolls, <laughs> which has been really fun. And then also contemplative Sabbath time, so some extended time for prayer, reading a devotional or a Christian book, journaling, spending time in God's word with him, either as a family, as a couple, by yourself, and then finally, aesthetic Sabbath time. So exposing yourself to places or things that you find refreshing, energizing, beautiful. So go for a hike, a ghost, go to a museum. We've got a lot of museums around here. Listen to some great music, something that would refresh and energize your soul. But in all of this, as soon as we start defining specific rules for what everyone can or can't do, what's in or out of Sabbath, that's when we begin to slip into legalism. And so it might look different for you as it will for me. But the point is that I believe that as a community, God is calling us into something new, into a different kind of life, into a slower type of life. And baby steps are okay as we learn together how to Sabbath. And as you practice Sabbath, you will find that while the Sabbath is not more than a day, it's not more than 24 hours, it's certainly not less. Brueggemann says it this way, people who keep Sabbath live all seven days differently, which I love. He said, there's a spirit of restfulness that will go with you throughout your week. Suddenly you find yourself living with ease and gratitude and appreciation and peace and prayer, things that maybe didn't come as naturally to you. And now you live in a more restful way. And you begin to work from rest, not for rest, with nothing to prove. And so when we talk about rest, not just for our bodies, but for our minds and our souls, the reason that Sabbath is both so hard for us to start and also so powerful is because it's breaking the idea that the world needs us constantly. It's breaking the delusion of self-importance that we may carry around with us, of gaining our value from what we can accomplish. But with Sabbath, it's a letting go. Sabbath is a weekly reminder that you are not the Lord. I had a friend who used to say, I am not the savior of the world. That is Jesus. And it's saying that my identity is not in my performance or in what I can do or who I can help or in what I can achieve or what I can acquire. It's not in being needed by everyone or fixing everything. It's being able to say that I'm able to rest when I know that my worth and my value and my meaning really my salvation is not in what I can produce or do for myself, but it's only through the grace of Jesus. Hebrews gives us a really powerful connection between rest and the gospel. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, So then, a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. And when we trust Jesus, when we find salvation in him, we're able to rest from the ultimate burden of trying to save ourselves and trying to earn God's approval. 
because no amount of doing or trying or effort or consuming or working will give you the peace and the rest that we are longing for. On the cross, Jesus reconciled us with God, and he paid the penalty for our sin, and by grace we come into his peace and into his rest. He is our Sabbath rest. And in the same way that God rested from his work, we have permission to rest from ours. And we get to allow God to speak the final word over us about our worth and our identity and about who we are and that we are simply enough in him. And on the Sabbath, we remember that the world does not define us. So at Christmas time, this season, we are looking for gifts. We're looking for gifts to give. We're making Christmas lists for ourselves, for our kids, looking for that perfect gift for the office Christmas party. But in the Sabbath, we've been given a gift. Every one of us has been given this gift. And it's a gift that points us to the ultimate source of rest in Jesus. And so would you stand? And I'm going to pray for us. So, Father, I thank you for the gift of rest. I thank you, God, that you are both a God who works and that you're a God who rests, that you're not above resting, but that you rested, and because of that, we can rest in you. God, I pray that we would hold our lives with open hands. God, I pray that we would trust you enough with all of our lives, with our work and with our rest. And God, I pray that you give us the want to want to experience this type of Sabbath rest, and that you would begin to help us to imagine what it would look like to enter into that rest and allow our souls to catch back up with our bodies. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open us up to you. Jesus, would you speak? We thank you for this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.